Today we're going to talk about the report that's been written by the Minister's Advisory Panel on Accessibility Legislation and their recommendations to the Minister of Community Services, Joanne Bernard, um, about what should be contained in the legislation. The Minister's Advisory Panel on Accessibility Legislation has just uh, completed its report and recommendations to the Minister that outlines what should be contained in the legislation. And today we're going to go through what's contained in that report for you. The Minister's Advisory Panel was uh, established on June 24, 2014. The panel and its committees were comprised of persons with a wealth of knowledge, experience and expertise in relation to both disability issues and the subject, subject matter that was discussed, which included uh, issues related to communications, labor market and employment opportunities, removing structural barriers in the built environment, attitudes and public awareness, transportation, client services, and housing. The majority of the members were people with disabilities, and the list of those members will be listed at the end of this um, session. The Secretariat, which was the group of government um, employees, uh, people from the Disabled Persons Commission and the Department of Community Services and Communications Nova Scotia, we met over a series of months, weekly, to um, ensure that people had the opportunity to participate in the public consultation process. And as I indicated earlier, uh, the public consultation process um, focused on key areas that we wanted to get feedback from the public on. So those areas, again, were information and communication, employment, design of public buildings and public spaces, attitudes and public education and awareness, transportation, client services, and housing. During the consultation process itself, the discussion paper um, was used in 11 different um, areas of the province. And we um, heard from over 250 people, over 100 online submissions, and 30 formal presentations, meaning that people came and presented at the public consultations. Overall, the discussion paper was well received by participants. The, the majority of the comments that we heard were related to standards development, implementation, and programs. And what that means is that um, when after the legislation is actually created, we will have to have a series of standards. And those standards are going to outline what people, businesses, government needs to do to um, adhere to the legislation. So we heard a lot of comments about that process. But first, we have to create the legislation itself. So there's actually two documents. There's this document that we're going to go through today that talks about only the legislation and what should be contained in the legislation. And there'll be a second document that's called What We Heard. And that will provide you with the information about what people said about the standards development process, which will come later. The panel recommends that the following principles be addressed in the legislation. The first principle is access, and that means that there should be no barriers that prevent a person from accessing places, goods, services, employment, information, and other functions that are generally available to everyone. The second principle is fairness. There should be no barriers that prevent a person from accessing those things that will give the person equality of opportunity and outcome, meaning that everybody has the same opportunities to participate. 
and that there's equality of outcome for people. The third one is alignment. This act should complement existing rights-based legislation and conventions. So it needs to complement the Nova Scotia Human Rights Act, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and any other provincial legislation that may be related to accessibility or persons with disabilities. The next principle is universal design. This means that access should be provided in a manner that minimizes barriers and differences based on a person's functional needs. In other words, if we, if we design things so that everybody can use them, then everybody benefits. You take, for example, ramps leading into buildings. They're universally designed so everybody can use them. It's not just people with disabilities who push the button or walk up the ramp. It's people who have packages. It's mothers or fathers who are push pushing strollers. Um, it's universally designed so that we can all use it. And so we want universal design to be a key principle of this legislation. The next principle is participation. Persons with disabilities should be meaningfully involved in all stages and facets of the legislation and standards, including full representation in the legislation's governance structure, thus putting into action, ac then, thus putting into action the concept of nothing about us without us. In other words, we don't want to see uh, legislation created that will not ensure that people with disabilities are fully involved in all stages of the process. The next principle is leadership. The government of Nova Scotia should be the leader and champion of this legislation through continuous public awareness and education activities. Realization of accessibility cannot be achieved without the full cooperation of both the provincial and municipal governments. The next principle is progressive realization. Progressive realization means that we want to see, the, see things continuously moving forward. It means that we know that in some instances things are going to have to take time, but there needs to be progressive realization, timelines established, should be aggressive but fair, taking into account the resources required to comply with a given standard. The last principle is prevention responsibility. And this means that the responsibility to remove and prevent barriers rests with the public or private organization that is responsible for putting up the barrier in the first place. So if you put up a barrier, you're responsible for removing it. We're now going to talk about um, the purpose of the legislation and what the panel felt the recommendation should be under this section. The purpose of the legislation should be that everyone has the right to participate fully in their community and to feel welcome where they live, work, learn, and play within an environment that is inclusive, welcoming, and fulfilling. The legislation should focus on the following areas, accessible information and communication, client service and public transportation, employment, and the built environment. The panel also agreed with participants from the consultations that education and training and health 
also be added as areas of focus. The panel also agreed that public education and awareness is not an area of focus, but is critical to the success of the legislation and must be part of every facet in developing accessibility legislation. So no matter what we do, whatever stage of the process we're at, there has to be a very robust public education and awareness campaign. I'm now going to go through each of the um, subcommittees um, and, and talk a bit about what they felt the purpose of the recommendation should, uh, sorry, what the purpose of the uh, legislation should be. So first, accessible information and communication. All Nova Scotians should be able to access the information or be able to get information communicated to them in a way that is fully accessible and they should be able to use appropriate, appropriate technology or assistive technology that will optimize their independence and full community participation. Standards developed under this focus area should embrace the concept of universal design as a fundamental principle in the design of products and communications and should be closely monitored for technological innovations. So in other words, whenever we're trying to communicate about something or um, we're designing some sort of a product, we need to keep in mind the concept of universal design and to ensure that we're uh, creating in a way that will meet the needs of everyone. The next uh, committee was client service. All Nova Scotians are able to access, access client services offered by a publicly funded government organization or service provided to the public by another party, including not-for-profit organizations, as well as private businesses, retail, hospitality, and professional services. All Nova Scotians are able to access public transportation systems, including parallel transit that fall within provincial and municipal areas of responsibility. Within Nova Scotia, this includes community-based accessible transportation from Yarmouth through to the Strait of Canso and the municipally run systems of accessible transportation in Halifax, Cape Breton, and Kings County. Standards developed under this focus area should guide organizations to ensure the broadest level of accessibility as it applies to all forms of public transportation. In practice, public trans transportation may not respond to all needs. Where alternatives are supported, they must be guided by principles of fairness, flexibility, and equity. Airports, rail, and interprovincial ferries are under the jurisdiction of the federal government and will not be included in this legislation. Employment. All Nova Scotia workplaces with government taking the lead are open, inclusive, fair, and accessible. Standards developed under this focus area should encourage employers to provide workplace accommodations, equal opportunities for hiring and advancement, equal pay for work of equal value, as well as safe and healthy working conditions. Accessibility, accessibility standards need to be carefully integrated with other legislation that addresses employment. The built environment. Now you'll recall that the built environment means public buildings, spaces around public buildings like walkways, pathways, parks, 
and it also refers to housing. So all Nova Scotians are able to access the built environment, which includes all buildings and infrastructure, including publicly owned buildings, privately owned buildings, publicly owned pedestrian rights of way, recreational facilities such as ball fields, pools and parks, and privately owned homes. Standards developed, developed under this focus area should enhance the accessibility of the built environment so that it is open to all Nova Scotians by using the principles of universal design and visit visitability when building and renovating. Any proposed standards for the built environment should clearly indicate how they would interact, interact with provisions of the Nova Scotia Building Code and the Building Code Act. Where the Nova Scotia Building Code articulates accessibility policy, standards should be harmonized. Voluntary standards to be used by home builders when building or renovating should be detailed. For pedestrian rights of way, a code similar to the Nova Scotia Building Code should be developed with enabling legislation of its own. Education and training was originally captured under the focus area of client service. Participants in the consultation felt that access within education and training environment is fundamentally important to one's economic and social inclusion. Standards developed under this area should focus on the broadest level of accessibility as it applies to all forms of education and training services. And lastly, health services. Health services were originally captured under the focus area of client service. Participants in the consultation felt that access within health services environments is fundamentally important to one's health and well-being. Standards developed under this area should focus on the broadest level of accessibility as it applies to all forms of health services for all Nova Scotians. And as we said earlier, while attitudes and public awareness were a key area of focus for the panel and the public discussion during the consultation, it is not being proposed as an area of focus in relation to the development of standards. Rather, attitudes and public awareness is about how the public is engaged and made aware of the challenges and opportunities that are connected to accessibility. When Ontario was doing their legislation, they have gone through two evaluations on their uh, legislation. The first evaluation was done by a man who had the last name of Beer, B-E-E-R. And the Beer Report, as it's called, talked a lot about the need for um, education and awareness and that in the rolling out of the Ontario legislation, they did not do a good job of educating and creating awareness. And they indicate in their evaluation that this is critical. So we want to learn from Ontario and we want to make sure that in the drafting of our legislation, that education and awareness is a, a, a key component of the work that we do. We're now going to talk about the section that refers to application, which really means who does the legislation apply to? The panel recommends that the legislation applies to the following. Anybody who provides information, goods, or services to the public, including public education and health care services, anybody who provides public transportation, anybody who employs people, or anybody who owns, leases, or rents a building, park, trail, or other outdoor space, or associated facility used for public space. The panel also recommends that exceptions, exceptions should be rare. 
and they also recommend that private homes of three units or less should be exempted, but through education and, awaren and awareness, barrier-free and visitability concepts should encourage Nova Scotians to build barrier-free homes. So while they may be exempted, we hope to do a very robust education and awareness campaign that will make homeowners understand the value and the benefit of creating homes that are visitable and barrier free. And I should also just explain to you what visitability means. Visitability means that when you build a house, you can get in um, to your house at a level entrance somewhere. So it could be through the front door, it could be through your garage, or it could be through a side door. But you have to have one entrance that is at level grade. The doorways all have to be wide enough for a wheelchair to be able to get through. Your bathroom has to be uh, reinforced and made big enough to um, be made accessible. And you have to have at least uh, one room on the ground level that could be used as a, as a bedroom. The next section that we're going to do is on governance. So this means how, who will be in charge of implementing the legislation. The panel recommends the establishment of an accessibility board and a secretariat under one of the following options. A minister should be uh, responsible for the accessibility legislation so in other words, a minister should be designated as being the minister responsible for the legislation. Or that the legislation would be housed within a government department, preferably justice, to administer the act. The panel also recommends that the accessibility board be impartial, the majority of its members be people with disabilities, but also include municipal government, post-secondary institutions, members from the private business sector, and not-for-profit organizations. The board would provide advice and techni technical expertise to the minister on standards development, implementation, and education and awareness campaigns. The next section that we're going to talk about is called the standard development process and we've been talking a lot about that, about how in order for the legislation to um, be implemented, there's going to need to be standards or rules created for each of the subject areas to tell people what they need to do um, in order to comply with the legislation. And in the second um, evaluation of the Ontario legislation, it's this area that, that, that has come into um, a fair amount of criticism, if you will. Um, a lot of the public are feeling that the standards aren't clear enough, and so they're not sure what they're supposed to do to comply. So we need to make sure that the standards that we develop are clear. So I'm going to go through what the, 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 the panel has recommended. Ambitious goals must be developed to identify, remove, and prevent barriers related to goods, services, information, employment, and the built environment. To meet these goals, practical implementation must be articulated relying on consultation with all affected stakeholders and members of the public. The panel also recommends that committees of persons with disabilities, stakeholders, and technical experts should be established to develop accessibility standards for the consideration by the Accessibility Board. The Accessibility Board will create procedures 
to allow comment by interested parties and experts and allow, and allow adoption of existing standards that have been shown to work effectively in other jurisdictions. So in other words, um, as we're going through the standard development phase, as the rules are created, a draft of those rules would then go out for public comment. People will have the opportunity to comment on them, and only then would they then be finalized. Any standard developed should include a means to appeal. That means if you don't agree with the standard or you don't think you fit the standard, there should be a way for you to appeal that decision. There should be a multi-level phased-in approach to implementing a sta standard in order to give businesses and individuals time to prepare. So it doesn't mean that when the standard is created and it becomes law, that the next day people are going to have to comply with it. It's going to mean that there has to be a phased-in approach that will provide people with the time to understand what the standard is and then to get their business ready to actually implement the standard. So, you know, there might be a year's gap between when the standard becomes law and when you actually have to comply with it. The panel also recommends establishing realistic time frames for reporting to the minister in terms of um, what you've done to comply with the uh, legislation. So in Ontario, again, you know, they have quite a process established in which businesses have to report to government about how they've complied with the legislation. So the panel's suggesting that we need to establish realistic time frames to allow people to do that reporting. We're now going to talk about the role of government. Governments, both provincial and municipal, should lead by example to reach the end goal of creating a barrier-free Nova Scotia. The provincial government should lead the development, implementation, and enforcement of accessibility legislation and should take down any barriers they put up. Government should publicize progress by producing updates that will encourage Nova Scotians to get involved. We're now going to talk about monitoring and compliance. What that means is that there has to be a way for us to monitor if people are um, implementing the legislation or, or, or are obeying to the legislation. And we have to find ways and means for them to comply with the legislation. So we're going to go through what some of those are. Monitoring and compliance provisions be articulated that ensure Nova Scotia becomes accessible to all in a timely manner. The Accessibility Board should develop procedures for identifying, accepting, and resolving complaints of non-compliance and set compliance timelines. So, let's say that there is uh, a, a, a uh, business that has not complied with the legislation. There would be a um, complaint mechanism, so there'd be a way for people to complain about that business. And then um, there would be a process by which that business would have to follow in order to become compliant. So they might get sent a letter saying, you know, um, you're, n you're not following the legislation and we're going to give you this amount of time to become compliant. The board should develop procedures for monitoring progress. For example, maybe a compliance checklist would be created and that checklist would be based on the principles of universal design. So there would be a checklist and 
the compliance officers or whoever will do the compliance would check off if a business has reached um, full compliance with the legislation. Education is key, and this includes m the municipalities, as they are the level of government that citizens engage with most often. So again, both the provincial government and the municipal governments are going to have to do a lot of education and awareness to get people on board. And the, the panel is also recommending to government that they consider robust enforcement approach for those who do not comply. So if you don't comply with the legislation, then there has to be some sort of penalty um, for not complying. The next section is incentives and penalties. Incentive and penalty provisions should allow the new accessibility board the means to reward success and effectively address situations where individuals or uh, businesses fail to comply with established standards. More specifically, the Accessibility Board should use a variety of means, including fines, time-limited variances, mediation, certification, and partial, partial certification, self-evaluation, and other effective, fair, and consistent sanctions. The panel is also recommending that their, that government develop grants or tax reductions as incentives. For example, businesses that do fully comply could receive a certificate that they could use to promote access the accessibility of their business. The panel also recommends considering tax reductions or grants to encourage compliance to diminish financial burden of compliance. So in other words, Let's say that it, it, it is going to be costly for uh, a business to comply with the legislation. They may be able to apply for a grant or get some sort of tax reduction that would help with that cost. All measures must be clearly communicated to the public. The next section we're going to do is other legislation implications. The panel also made the recommendation that it's very important that our legislation does not diminish the obligations of persons or businesses with respect to persons with disabilities that are already guaranteed under existing legislation like the Nova Scotia Human Rights Act. So we need to be very careful as we're developing this legislation that this legislation complements the legislation like the Human Rights Act. The panel also um, made a series of recommendations to the minister that's really about other policies and sort of other recommendations that fall outside of um, the focus areas that we talked about. As we said earlier, the, when we started down this road, public education awareness was going to be a theme area, a focus area. But the panel heard from many Nova Scotians and agreed as well that public education and awareness is key and a critical component overall as we um, create this legislation. So they wanted to focus some comments on what this public education and awareness campaign should look like. For our new legislation to be a success, we need the support, commitment, and participation of all Nova Scotians. Everyone has a right to understand what we are doing and why. We need to start a province-wide discussion 
about accessibility to promote a Nova Scotia that is truly open to all. The panel also recommended that the legislation needs to, or the, edu the public education and awareness campaign needs to provide clear communication about how we plan to meet each goal of our new accessibility legislation and continue to work with the public as these changes take place. Both broad-based and targeted um, educational approaches should be used to ensure the best coverage of messaging and a variety of media, including social media, print, radio, local magazines, they should all be used. And we're talking about targeted education awareness campaigns. We're talking about maybe an education awareness campaign is created solely for the construction industry or the housing industry. So, for example, if we really want people to understand what visitability means, we might do a targeted education and awareness campaign around visitability for the housing industry. Ongoing public education and awareness initiatives and campaigns should be developed early, before the standards are created. And we heard about this through the Ontario um, experience, that you need to start right away and you need to start early. And the campaign should continue throughout the development, implementation and monitoring phases of the legislation and standards development to encourage and maintain a change in attitudes towards persons with disabilities. So this is, the recommendation is that this not be a one-time only education and awareness campaign. It has to be consistent and continual. The panel also suggests that content messaging of public education, public education campaign should include information about the diversity of persons with disabilities, including invisible disabilities, the variety of barriers and challenges that persons with disabilities face every day, the business case and economic benefits of accessibility and inclusion, and other jurisdictions that have adopted accessibility legislation. The panel also suggests and recommends that we display the benefits associated with inclusion of persons with disabilities within Nova Scotia. These benefits are wide ranging from the economic benefits of increased hiring of persons with disabilities to the social benefits of ensuring equality and inclusion within society. Panel also recommends that we create education and awareness concerning individuals with mental illness or other forms of disability that are either not understood or discounted. And ensure that these individuals are treated fairly and with the same consideration as individuals with more visible disabilities. The panel also recommends consider various communication channels to improve attitudes and awareness, including social media, print, local, mag local magazines, and radio. Encourage workplaces to provide accessibility training to their employees and promote or reward workplaces observing accessibility guidelines and standards before the legislation or standards or are finalized. Also, they recommend publicizing information on other provinces that have adopted such legislation. Here in Canada, that includes Ontario and Manitoba. The panel also recommends educating and communicating to businesses on the benefits of maintaining accessible facilities share information demonstrating that friendly and inclusive communities are more creative, fun, and prosperous than undeveloped communities. They also recommend ensuring 
the public is aware of educational resources available that will suit unique needs. For example, a specialized classes within public schools. So what are the next steps now? The report, as you know, has just been released. We've prepared all of this documentation in a variety of accessible uh, format, including ASL. And you will be able to get access to other alternate formats on our website. There is one piece of work that's still to be done. And that is the What We Heard document, as it's called. You will notice if you go to the, the written uh, report on the legislation that there is a lengthy sec section in there called What We Heard. There's going to be another document put up on the web very shortly that will uh, be in ASL and will outline all of what is contained in the What We Heard document. So you will be getting access to that information, but it will be done when the What We Heard document is released. Thank you very much.